when we have to address topics and to be quite frank and honest there is absolutely no easy way for us to do this we've just received confirmation from the um, RCIPS that they are investigating an incident that happened last night involving a member of the government now Cayman Mall Road um, broke this story into the late hours um, you know up to midnight last night we were getting information about the incident and of course, immediately we had 97% of the details in terms of the who, the what, the when, the where, and all of that information. We put out an initial post stating that we understand a politician um, has in fact been um, involved in an altercation. And um, we were waiting to get additional details before we actually posted it on the website. As of this morning, we were in a position to post further details on the website, um, including essentially what transpired. There was some information that was purposely left out because we were still attempting in this type of situation to always protect the victim whenever possible. Now, for those of you who have been living in a hole and may not have heard, unfortunately, uh, a member of government and actually the Speaker of the House, Mr. McKeever Bush, is now being investigated for assaulting a bar manager at an establishment in West Bay Road, which we identified in our article as Coral Beach. Um, I think it's just called Coral Beach. It's a relatively new establishment. We don't wanna say too much about the relationship of the parties, because again, it is sort of, um, it, not, it is a domestic um, situation, not domestic in the sense that um, the two of them have any kind of a, a personal relationship. That's not what I mean when I say domestic. I'm thinking more of on the abuse side. There was an actual assault of this woman. And the parties are known to each other, but you know they're known from the information that we have received uh, just in a professional capacity. And that's all I wanna say about that because I don't wanna get into too much of those details. There are a couple of things that must be addressed in this editorial segment today. First and foremost, I want to address the persons who have said to us, why have you not named him? Because Cayman Mall Road has a reputation of people like to call it naming and shaming. And so I wanna address that first before I get into the details of continued violence against women in this community. And in particular, not just by men in general, but by our politicians who seem to have a real penance for this sort of thing. And I don't know if it's a power trip and maybe there is a correlation between men who are power tripping and um, getting into politics. And, you know, they're also narcissists and they also abuse women and they have these, all these other traits sometimes that makes them larger than life, but also makes them incredibly dangerous men to be around. I don't know if there is a connection there, but I want us to talk about the fact that there are a good number of politicians and persons in the House who've had a history some are reformed and some are not reformed. Some are continuing to abuse women. And in order for us to address this issue, we have to have a very frank and honest discussion about the fact that number one, it's happening in our community. Number two, we can no longer hide the perpetrators and who they are. Number three, what are we doing to bring such persons to justice? And what are we doing to protect the victims in this community? So let me first start talking about why we did not initially name the Speaker of the House as the individual who allegedly had perpetrated this assault. 
Uh, first of all, when we received the information, obviously the first bit of information we got was who was involved. So we knew from the onset that it was Makiva Bush. However, when our sources, and again, Cayman Mall Road relies 100% in our sources, and that is why we go to any length to protect our sources. Our sources never have to wonder, even if we get dragged into court, we will never divulge our sources. Our sources are safe because at the end of the day, that is our bread and butter. And if that means that we have to, um, you know, go to jail ourselves, we are prepared to do that. Because again, there's so many people in this community who want to speak out, but they're afraid of the retribution that comes with them uh, making the decision to be vocal and to speak out. So we give the voiceless a voice in this community and we recognize the importance of that. So the first thing is we received the information. We knew that it was Makiva Bush that was involved. We decided to put it up generally speaking. One of the reasons why we put up information in the way in which we do is sometimes even if we have 97% of the story, we will continue to dig and um, by putting it up, that is almost a method of pulling out additional sources and pulling out additional information. Because the second we put that up, eyewitnesses will say, oh, guess what? Let me check my phone. You know what, Sandy? I was there too. I witnessed this happen. I know, you know exactly what's going on. I've got the video. I've seen the photos. And so essentially what we do is we pull out the remainder of the story by putting up the 97% of the story. And on a number of occasions, we have had to do that. So um, this was one of those situations where we were doing precisely that. The difference between this, you know, we did a story last week with a young lady who uh, we named. She had pled not guilty to theft. And someone said to me, well, what's the difference between naming her and not naming this political figure? Is it because you're afraid? Now, I would hope that those of you who followed Cayman Mall Road will be well informed that we are not afraid of politicians. We are not afraid of anyone in this country because we feel that as media, we have an obligation to the people of the Cayman Islands on more levels than one. And in particular, when it comes to the government, we are the fourth arm of government and we help to keep them in check. So no, we, we're not afraid of politicians. Just last week, we called out the premier of this country um, on our Cold Hard Truth show. We went at him pretty hard. If we were afraid of any kind of political retribution or I don't know what kind of retribution they would come at us with, uh, that show would have never happened. And we would have not spoke quite frankly and honestly about our feelings and the position that we take on certain things when it comes to the premier. And you have to just be that type of person to operate in this space within the Cayman Islands. So no, we are not afraid. But I want to point out a couple differences that may not be obvious from the onset, but really do make a humongous difference whether or not we name or shame anyone. First of all, the type of offense is important. So in this particular case, any sort of domestic violence or violence against women, sexual assault, rape, we are very, very cognizant of how we name either parties, to be frank, because we're always trying to protect the victim with the end goal of having that person prosecuted. Let me give you an example. Some months ago, um, we named a particular DJ on island who um, you know, has been arrested in relation to some sexual assault charges against a teenager. Now, in that particular instance, that individual was arrested at that point. The story that we did prior to that, which was about that individual getting involved in an altercation at his place of work um, at Royal Palms, if you notice, we did not name him. So again, this is where sometimes people do not pay attention to the um, sort of, you know, intricate way in which we handle our stories in which we do certain things. So we didn't name him on the onset. We wanted to wait until he was actually arrested for that offense. Once we received confirmation that he had been arrested, then we named him. Now there's certain situations where we name people in, in advance. So if it's like, you know, there's a fight, for example, um, at an establishment, and someone captured it on video. We have no doubts of the identity of the person. Everyone can see who it is. 
you know, we're going to put that information up. Sometimes we may not even name them, but we're going to put the video up. So essentially everyone knows who the person is in any event. And it happens in a very, very public space, but it does depend on the nature of the event. So if it's two guys who are having a brawl, who are fighting, that's very different than a man alleging to have grabbed a woman by her hair, choking her, punching her, and that sort of thing. So the type of offense does matter. In the case of the Filipina lady who actually stole money, the other critical thing with that particular situation is that we actually had the victim speak to us. We had her on camera and she was more than happy to tell her story and to share the details of what happened. So we had a firsthand account. Not only that, but there's an actual court file on this young lady that demonstrates the police carried out an investigation. So despite the fact that she decided to plead guilty and the DPP's office quite shockingly allowed her to get away with just paying the money back, there was sufficient information on the file to let people know that there was no question about her guilt. So pleading guilty doesn't mean you're guilty. The DPP giving you a walk and giving you, you know, pass doesn't mean that you're innocent. Um, it doesn't speak to your guilt at all. It's just, it just means, in my opinion, that they just couldn't be bothered with that particular prosecution. They were probably thinking, what's the end goal? Just have her pay it back and that's it. Where people found this story interesting is because there is an element of unfairness with how it appears that the DPP handles certain cases. And that was the whole point of that story, really, is that there are Caymanians who have been hauled into jail, as well as foreigners, for far less than that. Those persons have been arrested, have been charged, and have faced consequences um, as a result of their actions. So what really makes this individual different from anyone else? Only God knows. That's only a question that the DPP and whatever prosecutor that was handling the case could answer. But again, there was CCTV footage of her that the police obtained in their investigation that proved beyond a reasonable doubt that it was her that took the money. The footage was crystal clear. And in addition to that, she was not the brightest person in the sense that she actually wore her uniform, um, her Renaissance uniform, to the, the machine to take out the money. You know, so what explanation do you have? What explanation do you have for why not one, but two debit cards went missing when you were friends with your coworker? One was found under a bed that only you would have had access to in an apartment in the same complex. And the second one, whilst not, if not found, um, you were spotted on CCTV footage on six different occasions re removing money. So in a case like that, it's theft. We have no issues naming her. We spoke to the victim. Um, the victim was happy to give her side of the story. We have, you know, had some correspondence with the woman as well. She claims that she's got a story to share. We'll see if she ever decides to go on camera. Um, so I just want to make it clear that there are some very important distinctions here to make when we name people versus when we don't. So someone else mentioned another case where there was a husband who came forward and, you know, was outing his wife about the fact of how she had left him. In the end, it turns out that he appears like he was just a husband scorned. Um, and he provided a lot of information, a lot of evidence, the fact that they were still married and that she had left him and she had abandoned, allegedly abandoned the children and, you know, information about um, his HIV status and her HIV status. But again, you have a person and we had all of the audio notes from all of the parties who they are willing to come out and say, I'm going to put my name on the line. I'm going to say, this is my story involving this other person. This is what has happened, X, Y, Z. So even if we are keeping the identity of the complainant private, if they are still going on record with us and saying, this is my firsthand account of this situation, this is what has transpired. We always attempt to get evidence. We say, you know, where's the messages? Where are the text messages? Where's um, the voice notes? Whatever you have, provide it to us. So there is a vetting process that we go through and that we listen to and that we read and all of that before we actually name persons. And I know a lot of people think, oh, we're just throwing names up there kind of willy nilly. But in reality, that is not how it works at all. As you'll remember with David Marshall, he's the former attorney at Maples and Calder. He had assaulted his wife. And again, that was a domestic situation. We never named the wife until she contacted us, supposedly with a letter signed under her own signature, willing to make a public statement. So she wanted that information released 
that that's not what happened, et cetera, et cetera. But the information that was obtained was public information already in the public realm in the United States of America. The difference in the US is they treat domestic situations and in particular in the state of Florida, extremely seriously to the point where if they show up to a domestic call, someone is going to jail and they don't need the victim to cooperate they don't need the victim to say, yes, he did it, because there's an understanding of how violence against women works in communities. And a lot of times women are afraid to speak out about what happened to them. But if you have obvious evidence, like the woman's face is bruised, you know, in that case, they had the video from the hotel, which proved that she came out of her room injured. When she went in, she wasn't injured. He was the only person in there. So there's something in law, I'm trying to remember the legal term now, but it's like <clears throat> the little translation, I think it's res ipsa locator if I'm remembering correctly from my law degree, but <clears throat> it basically says that the thing speaks for itself. So in other words, it is so evident, it is so obvious what transpired, there could be no other logical conclusion. What are we to believe that she beat herself up? That she assaulted herself to the point where she had fractures in the bones in her face and then she would have come out of the hotel room and just passed out you know in front of someone else's door and the documentation all of those arrest records the court records uh, in the u.s those are all a matter of public information none of that is considered private and so his name was out there fairly early on not just on our platform, but in other media sources as well. So I think it's important to recognize that if we have firsthand accounts, we have firsthand complainants coming forward, um, depending on the type of offense that is also involved, and we have corroborating evidence, videos, photos, etc., we are more apt to name the individual. One of the issues that we were facing last night is we had reports that there was photos and people were recording this and taking pictures, but we did not actually have those ourselves. That is another reason why we were not prepared to name Mr. Bush at that particular time. The police have since confirmed that there was an incident and I wanna read a little bit of um, what they shared here. So they're saying that just after 1230, and of course our timing is, is a little bit different than theirs, um, they said that they received a report. Well, the incident actually happened earlier is what happened. So they received a report of an incident that took place at a liquor license establishment on West Bay Road. It was reported that a public figure in the Cayman Islands had assaulted a female at the location, resulting in her receiving minor injuries. Now, what their definition of minor injuries is, I do not know. Um, they go on to say that the matter is being investigated and um, anyone with information is encouraged to contact the police. And this is where I think it's very important that people now step up to the plate. And if they were indeed witnesses and they saw what happened, you need to provide that information to the authorities. So let's just change gears a little bit here because I think it's, it's, it's shocking that this incident has happened. And then in many respects, it's not so shocking because we hear of these types of things happening all the time. And Mr. McKeever Bush would not be the only person in the legislative assembly that has been accused of this type of horrendous behavior against women. Most of the times it is against their spouses and someone that they are in a relationship with, but there have been instances where that is not even necessarily the case. So, First of all, the history of domestic violence and abuse against women in the Cayman Islands is a long standing issue. We have, you know, our um, days of activism, you know, we constantly protest, uh, we have a march through town. But when we look at even the legislation that is in place, um, how women's rights are treated in this country. The fact that women and children have to fight so incredibly hard to get some of the most basic rights enshrined in law demonstrates and illustrates the fact that our legislators, which are predominantly men, do not care about these issues. And it's deplorable. And it shouldn't matter if it's the Speaker of the House or some little guy walking the street. If you are um, engaging in this type of behavior, it should be taken extremely seriously. And there should be resources available for victims as well as making sure that the perpetrator will be held accountable for their behavior. So when we put this story up, I was surprised that for once it seems like 
everyone was really like, this is horrible. This is incredibly wrong. Why is it that our public officials continue to engage in this type of behavior? You know, I saw one comment where the person said, oh, he's just a man. We all make mistakes. Yes, we do. We all make mistakes and we all have to be held accountable for those mistakes. Now, when we continue to do the same thing over and over again, is it truly a mistake or do we have a situation where perhaps uh, that individual needs some serious help and some serious attention? You know, the victims are who we need to focus on and who we need to talk about. The fact that in this country, if a victim says, I don't want to prosecute, I just want the person warned, I'm not prepared to go through all of this. And there's a mirage of reasons why that could be the case. Sometimes victims are in work permits and they're afraid of repercussions. Sometimes they're afraid of these people, of these public officials who are in a position of power. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's a small community. So automatically everyone is gonna know who that person is and there's always backlash against the, the victim. Well, why, why are you gonna press charges against someone that we like politically or that you know, has been a politician for 30 years or 20 years or whatever? So the victim is in the most horrendous of positions in particular here in the Cayman Islands. And this is why we need legislation that seeks to protect victims, perhaps even more so than in other communities. So what I mean by that is the prosecutors and the police have got to be prepared to charge an individual respective of what the victim says to them. There was another case with a Cayman Bracker some years ago, he was in court and he was named and it was going through the whole process. The victim in the end decided that she did not want to move forward with the allegations um, and go to trial. And so the prosecution submitted no evidence and it was dropped. And this person was able to keep his high ranking government job and nothing ever came of it. So you could see how easily women can be taken advantage of, women can be abused, women can say, you know, we have a, a huge expat population here. A lot of persons come from um, countries that are financially um, less viable than the Cayman Islands. So if you say to person, someone, I'm going to give you $5,000 for you to just turn a blind eye to this and to ignore this, for some people, $5,000 is a lot of money to be able to send home to their families and help build a house or whatever, and they're willing to let it go. And the system should not allow that to happen. The system should not allow victims of violence, anyone, but in particular women and children, to be able to say as the victim, oh, I don't wanna pursue this, especially when you've got independent evidence, you've got eyewitnesses, you've got CCTV footage that you need to go and grab today before, as in the case with Lonnie Tibbetts, you know, he's in court for assaulting a woman, <clears throat> The CCTV footage, oops, sorry, the footage from that day just isn't working. Um, a primary eyewitness who was the security guard on duty at that particular time has been shipped back by his employer off island. So there's so many things that can quickly go wrong and can quickly go ar awry that would lessen the chances of a successful prosecution. And I think that is precisely why it is extremely important for the government to ensure, and of course, it's like the you put in the hen in the in the um what's it called the hen in the chicken house or hen house or whatever, you know. But police are supposed to be independent. The DPP's office is supposed to be independent. Those are the agencies that are responsible for bringing these cases to court and bringing these situations to justice. They need to push for legislation that protects the victims at all costs and not only protects the victims, but it's already there as far as I know, giving them the power to do what they need to do, even if the victim says no. In the US, the victim does not have to be um, a compliant witness. And they get that, that a lot of victims will not help them with their prosecution. And they will proceed in any event and they have successfully proceeded against thousands of people where the victim has said, no, I don't wanna be you know, the one on the stand. I don't wanna provide any information. So I hope that we can understand and the police can start pushing those cases a bit more because it's unfortunate when they let it go and say, oh, well, the victim just wasn't cooperating. I mean, to me, that absolutely makes no sense at all for these types of situations. And it really does, in my opinion, um, you know, make me feel like we are not serious. We're committed to fighting this issue of violence against women. 
And there have been so many stories. I mean, I can recount hearing of so-and-so breaking their wife's arm and sending them overseas to get treatment so that there'd be no record of them having gotten treatment in the Cayman Islands. Um, you know, again, we, we mentioned this in one of our articles, co-workers in government positions, directors of agencies, hitting people at work, assaulting people physically at work, and absolutely nothing coming of it. This has got to stop. As a community, as a country, if we're not prepared to protect the most vulnerable people in our society, which include our women, women are financially vulnerable and they're vulnerable in terms of the status that they have in the community, this is a good old boys network that continues to operate and continues to hold us down. And any woman that dares to question it or tries to rise above it, we're a troublemaker. We're a big B-I-T-C-H, you know, and they hold us down by even some of our own women, our own counterparts will hold us down and stand along their male counterparts who don't consider them equals to try and tear other women down because this is how we do it. This is how our culture has trained us, um, that we're not to accept women who come across as, as strong, as independent, as having a voice of their own, as, as having their own thought processes. And that is why we can only ever get three at the most elected women in the legislative assembly out of how many? Seriously, the, the female population in this country accounts for uh, more than the male population. So even in terms of equal representation, we're not able to get equal representation in the legislative assembly. And that says a lot about who we are as a country. And this is, this is really a dark place, I think, that a lot of us don't want to go and we do not want to have those discussions. But when our women are vulnerable, when women are failing in your society, you're exposing your children as a result of that to all sorts of ills as well. Um, and you're compromising the entire structure of your families and of your communities as a result. And that leads to a whole slew of other social issues as well. So we could go so much deeper in this discussion and we will need to have, I think, this dialogue as an ongoing dialogue. This isn't something that we're just done with today. But I wanted to just briefly address, you know, some of the comments that we had seen. We even saw Mr. Ezard Miller, <coughs> sorry, Mr. Ezard Miller post a comment on Instagram <clears throat> that it wasn't him. And, you know, we should name who it is um, that's involved in this altercation. And, you know, we're not trying to play politics with this. We don't have any political alliance to anyone. We don't care if Mr. Bush is PPM, CDP, UDP, independent, it does not matter, right? Just like we reported on the fact that Mr. Dwayne Seymour attempted to assault someone at a football game, we reported on that and yes, we named him. <clears throat> but again, that situation was different for two primary reasons. Number one, the um, Victim was a man who was very capable, in my opinion, of taking on Dwayne Seymour had it gotten physical. Number two, it didn't actually get physical. And number three, when the incident happened, we actually did not report it immediately when it happened. So there were details and there were reasons why that was not done. So it wasn't done until about, I think, a month or month and a half later that we actually, and we knew about it from the onset, but we waited for a particular reason and then we divulge information so sometimes timing can be everything and we don't necessarily jump on the second we get information or we're gonna put this out there there has to be a reason why in this case we felt that it was necessary to um, put the information out there <clears throat> to let people know number one what had transpired number two everybody saw it I mean there were witnesses tourists I mean I can't tell you the countless emails that we have received even today, just continually going through our email from people who are aware of it, who were there, who saw it, who knew somebody who was there, who received a phone call. So unfortunately for Mr. Bush, this is not something that can hide. And, you know, we have seen Mr. Bush, um, I think it was over a year ago, was arrested in Miami. He was facing some charges or something of allegedly um, touching a woman in her rear. That disappeared, that went away. Um, but again, that arrest was very public. 
We receive the information because in the States, they don't care who you are, right? The information is going to get out there. And once we received it, we published it. So we published information calling Mr. Bush's name before. This situation is no different, except that some of the circumstances warranted us not immediately identifying who the perpetrator was. Um, the other thing that I want to say to the young lady who's been victimized in this situation, uh, as I've stated, <clears throat> there are certain things that we're not gonna say about your situation that I think compromises um, you know, your identity. However, I wish that you will cooperate with the police. It is my understanding that you filed a police report but you just want him <clears throat> to be cautioned. As I've said, the police don't have to take you up on that. You don't get to, as a victim, you don't actually get to dictate the process in terms of what happens to your assailant. And that's correct legally, because at the end of the day, I think that um, it's dangerous when you allow victims to do that, as we've mentioned earlier, because there's so many reasons why a victim may do that out of fear of you know repercussions, fear of losing their jobs, fear of being kicked off of this island, fear of having status revoked. You know, there's all sorts of things that people have to be fearful of in a very, very real way because people are incredibly vindictive on this island. And the, the political power that comes with, um, you know, being a politician in such a small place goes a long way. So the men that witnessed it, you know, I know that men had to come to her rescue last night and to stop the assault. Um, I am hoping that this will be some sort of catalyst for change for Mr. Bush. Um, whether we like Mr. Bush or not is not the issue here. If you have a problem, if you continually find yourself and the exact same situations over and over again where people are videotaping you doing certain things or photographing you doing certain things in public, then you've got to start addressing why is it that I am engaging in this type of behavior. There's something a lot more deep-seated about what is going on here. And I would hope that he gets the professional help that he needs, but at the end of the day, the assault that was carried out, in my opinion, despite the police report saying that it was minor, I'm not of the opinion that it was minor. I heard the woman had bruises all over her face, kind of immediately sort of thing. She was choked, her hair was pulled. That's ABH. If she has those types of injuries, as you know, has been indicated to us, that's ABH and that's not a minor situation. So even the press release um, by the RCIPS is trying to downplay it and saying that the person had minor injuries. Well, how do you define minor? What maybe is minor to their press officer may not be minor to me. I mean, I don't really know. But uh, I hope that the police will take this matter seriously and will do their job. It's in the public domain. So naturally, we will be watching and waiting for the outcome of this situation to see how this plays out and precisely what happens. And I hope that she understands that there are a lot of women out there who are standing behind you, who are supportive of you, um, but you also have an obligation to stand up and to say, you know what, what happened to me was wrong and someone needs to be held accountable for this. Warning someone probably isn't gonna cut it. You know, you need to accept that you now have a responsibility to other victims and perhaps protecting other people in the future from being victimized if you stand up and do the right thing. And standing up and doing the right thing, especially when you are a victim, is never, never, ever an easy thing to do. <clears throat> I deal with victims all the time. A lot of them sexual assault victims. Right now, we have a case where a young man was sexually assaulted by someone who has now obtained a taxi driver license. This is the kind of BS that happens in the Cayman Islands that honestly pisses me off. But we have so few checks and balances in place, you know, that it's almost more important for victims to stand up and say, I have to be counted. My story will not just be a story that's going to fade away into nothing and nothing come of this. Because if I'm not counted and I do not stop at least one perpetrator, how many more people will they and others like them be able to abuse and victimize. 
And that honestly has got to be how victims start thinking about the situation. And we know that it's not an easy road to ask you to travel. <clears throat> I'm well aware of that. I'm well aware of the roadblocks that are in place in the system and the people around you, but you have got to be prepared to stand up, number one, for yourself, and number two, for any and all women, because we all have sisters, we all have aunts, we all have grandmothers, and we all came from the womb of a mother, of a woman. And so that in and of itself should be reason enough that as a woman, you would want to protect any other woman out there from going through something as difficult and challenging as any sort of abuse that you have endured yourself. So once again, it's um, you know another crazy day here in the Cayman Islands. Unacceptable behavior. Nobody can sugarcoat this. Um, there are character traits of Mr. Bush that a lot of us like. He's very charismatic. Um, you know, a lot of us believe that at his core, he's actually a good person. But sometimes, even good people are extremely flawed, and they need professional help. You know, we, we might be flawed or damaged for a myriad of reasons, oftentimes because we have been damaged ourselves as children. And we carry that baggage throughout our entire lives and there's situations that we find ourselves in that we react in the worst possible way. And that reaction is demonstrative of the fact that we need to get help. There is no shame in asking for help. There's no shame in saying that I've got a problem that I need to address. And only a professional can help me address that. You cannot do it on your own. And there are people who will be around you who are um, you know, encouraging the bad behavior. And it has to stop. Whether that encouragement means you know, keeping you around alcohol when you should probably should touch alcohol, they're enabling you. And enablers, they have someone to answer to as well. So I just wanna leave my comments there. I don't want this to be too laborious, but I just want to go ahead and leave it there for now. But I thought that this was important enough to take time out of my Saturday afternoon away from my family to really address this issue. Um, there have been other persons, Mr. Austin Harris, for example, he has been honest, at least in the instance of, you know, when his case came to court, that there was a domestic situation there as well with a young lady that he was in some sort of a relationship with. And going into the last election, Austin said, listen, I, I own up to what I did. Um, you know, I have sought help and I'm getting help about this. I do have a problem and it's something that I'm working on. And from all accounts, um, Austin Harris and I are not close friends, so I can't say this in personal knowledge, but from all accounts of the people who are around him, I have heard that they have seen quite a significant change in his personality, in his behavior, in particular when it comes to how he relates and treats women because he has been getting help with that. And perhaps he also, and perhaps he also recognized that alcohol, um, you know, is something that he should not be spending a lot of time around as well, that it compromises his ability to make good sensible decisions. Anyway, folks, I thank you so much for tuning in to this special segment here on Cayman Mall Road. Again, it's an editorial segment, so these are certainly my opinions and you're entitled to yours. And I do welcome um, you guys sharing those at any time with us here. We've got a variety of different platforms that we um, allow people to be able to share their opinions on. So again, sort of breaking news, but we are hopeful that there will be some positivity that comes out of this regardless. Have a wonderful day. Yeah.